Ben, I think we're ready. Are we excited? We're ready for this? I just wanted to compliment the crews. I know you guys have gone back out, cleared out a lot of the streets in the neighborhoods and gotten rid of some of those big ridges. At least from my neighborhood, a lot of people have really complimented the team. They came in and did it quietly and got it cleaned up and now it seems to be curb to curb and people can move around a little bit better. So I know that's been a lot of work on the team's part, but thank you very much. Yeah, we, we've also had a lot of support from our, our local contractors. Of course, they're they're benefiting from it, but they also spend money in our community and buy new buy new trucks and stuff like that. So it's an unbelievable number. Right around the clock, we're still running about uh, 55 tandem dump trucks around the clock, still cleaning up. So hopefully by tomorrow, we're gonna idle that back and 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 kind of call it quits. Not call it quits, but uh, move towards just using our crews. So we can get started. This is uh, kind of perfect timing after we thought we had uh, one of the biggest winters as far as severe uh, last winter. And then here we go again this winter in a different form. Last winter, February was the heaviest uh, snow accumulation month on record. This winter, as far as I can remember from when I started in 96, um, it, it's one of the heaviest snowfalls in the early part of the winter. So it's it's been interesting. So nothing but like the present to move forward and do a little update on snow removal operations. And uh, I know that everybody's taken a look at kind of our draft snow gate study that uh, Wink and Associates has done for us. I have that on there to start uh, uh, spreading that uh, information a little bit. And then what really brought us here today is parking restrictions and what we've done so far to get to the point where we think we have the groundwork laid to be able to declare a snow emergency, which would require the, the vehicles to get off the streets. So as we get going here, um, one of my favorite pictures, uh, Commissioner Pipcorn, one of your uh, favorite spots, 19th Avenue North up there, opening it up. Um, uh, but we really wanted to set the, the table here and talk a little bit about growth and how we've dealt with that um, based on our priorities, how we go through and plow the city, and then our goals. And it's interesting when I touch on our goals that not much has changed, but our equipment has. That's the big thing. Um, we also have seen development changes over the last 10 years. And then how are our existing areas affecting us? And then I have one emerging issue. I put issues on there, but really I put one in here to cover what I think it's important that you as commissioners and elected officials know uh, the, the, the rapid change and increase we're seeing in, in sidewalk code enforcement. So let's get this rolling. Um, fun stuff here, 2010 to 2020, I have these numbers because I was actually uh, given the position in 2010 to be the director, so I've been tracking this all the way. Um, we had some real significant growth between 2010 and 2015. I think everybody is fully aware of that. That's when we saw construction prices go through the roof. Um, and so we experienced about 150 lane miles worth of growth in just that five years. Since 15, you know, it's somewhat slowed down. We're about that 20 to 30 lane miles. But what we see in our business is not necessarily what engineering sees in theirs. They, they have a rush on the infrastructure requests, but we don't see the severity of, of growth accumulated and put pressure on public works until about year five, because that's when the houses start filling in. That's when all the lots start filling up. That's when the commercial areas start filling all in. So we see a, a level of service required uh, move dramatically over that time. So what we're seeing now is kind of a peak to what we've done over the last 10 years with all this growth. Um, through our planning department, we've had a lot of success in, in reducing cul-de-sacs. I shouldn't say reducing, but not growing in cul-de-sac numbers. Um, and then our alleys have remained the same. And those are kind of the three critical things, lane miles, cul-de-sacs, and alleys that, that uh, tip the scales when it comes to snow removal. Plowing priorities. This is something we've done since Denny's day, since I started here, since uh, the, kind of the, the start of snow removal with the city of Fargo, I would say, is you got to have your snow emergency routes. That's our arterial routes that we keep clean that our fine folks wearing the badges here use to move around our fine city. Um, then we move into our secondary routes, which are collector streets. Those are the streets that will get our emergency services close to our residential homes, but not up to the front door. And then we have our residential routes. Um, you know, we're broke up into 15 zones within the city uh, for our residential routes. And everybody always says, how come north side gets done sooner than south side? 
well they're all about the same size about twenty miles of roads in each zone but it's obvious that north side has trees trees bring the difference in the game changer when it comes to snow a snow event can produce six foot drifts on south side of town that we see hardly any drifts on the north side of town so what we do in eight hours on the north side will require 16 on the south side I, I this was from a presentation I gave in 2010 these are our plowing goals I gave it to the Commission at that time and this is the goals we follow we still operate under today um, our primary routes we listed you know you can see the difference between day and night operations is roughly about two hours difference and that's traffic related um, as we move into our secondary routes primarily the same thing but when we look at our total completion this is where this winter has been different than other winters usual winters we see a lot of two to four accumulations and don't see the six plus accumulations so when you look at the hours it takes to plow our city two to four versus six there's a dramatic difference and then you put wind in involved alleys are pretty consistent but again these are all estimated completion times from when the snow stops falling it's not from when it starts it's when from when it stops you want to know how we've managed our growth we've added 200 lane miles in the last 10 years so how have we done that in 2010 we had 23 pieces of equipment in 2020 we have 26 but as you look at that you'll see that we're changing what we're using for equipment in 2010 every one of our plow trucks was plow trucks with just a front blade on it there was no wing plows and so what that restricted us to is one truck did one lane since then um, as replacements have come up and as we've improved our fleet we've changed it and we've added that wing plow to everything what that has allowed us to do is take what used to take two trucks in a residential neighborhood we can now do with one motor grader and so that's how we've minimized the growth factor of our city resources and our staffing good bad where well, plow times are still the same but we've kind of boxed ourselves in a corner because everything has wings and has to have wings now when we talk about new development from 2000 to 2000 or I'm sorry 2010 to 2015 we saw a lot of traditional development 80 foot lots 32 foot wide streets a lot of space for snow storage in the winter time now in the last five years we've seen a, a kind of a growth trend um, changing to our average size lot ranging between that 38 feet to 60 feet um, and what that does is that causes significant issues with snow storage it's driveway to driveway like you can see in the top picture there that is what we're faced with in a lot of our new developments and as we look at our new developments and how we're moving forward that is putting a lot of stress on our equipment because there's no place to put the snow but really the residents because if you look at it there in the picture there's only one place the snow can go it's in the driveway and so unknowingly when these people buy these entry-level homes which is what we want they end up with an issue that there's a lot of frustration when it comes down to February and March every year when we've seen these snow snow winters like we have existing development is what I'm talking about is redevelopment we've seen on the other side of things um, it's great we love to see it happen but we've seen our north side streets turn into parking issues and parking nightmares um, this is from our last event um, where you see the cars are parked on the street we asked that if the residents could please remove the vehicles from the street and this is somewhat the response we get um, this causes us to have more accidents more stress and slower plowing times the bottom picture is actually Lee Anderson took for me in his pickup which is an f-250 with a nine-foot plow on the front but he could barely get down that street and now we're talking we want to get emergency services in there so we have a significant issue um, with parking and hopefully today we'll introduce and maybe put a stamp and uh, that we can move forward with some parking changes that we've discussed over the past summer this is that emerging issue so in 2014-15 sidewalk code enforcement these are the folks that are not maintaining their sidewalks we received complaints about 230 last year almost 1600 so in five years we've seen just an unbelievable growth in either we have an active vibrant community that likes to be outside in the winter time 
Yes, I absolutely think that. But we are also seeing a trend where we're seeing less residents, cust or commercial businesses, stuff like that, do the maintenance on their sidewalks and remove the snow until we come and impose and tell them to do it. Um, today, current complaints were at 945 for the year. So this is something that we've been trying to deal with in, in our department of how to handle that growth in that complaint structure. Right now we've been doing it with the same people that do our 31 miles of sidewalks. After they get them done, they go out and they start doing code enforcement. So oftentimes uh, in a two day span, they have anywhere from 80 to 100 sidewalks to inspect. This is the hot topic of the day. Not quite, we're gonna talk parking, so we're really excited about that. But driveway windrow clearing. And windrow is a word. I, I got called on it by my wife and a couple others. It is a word, I looked it up. Um, I didn't just throw it out there for a typo to see who would catch it. But we've done this snow gate study. Um, I, I presented or, or emailed all of you the draft study a couple weeks ago. I have presented you with a finalized study that has not been signed off on yet, so we can still look at some changes if we need to after you get a chance to review it again. Um, but the numbers are in. The data is here. It is what it is. We also want to take a look at some other options that might be out there to help our residents out. And so um, with some uh, brainstorming, some search in the internet, uh, we've been able to put some numbers together of what it might take if we wanted to go in a different direction. So Wankin Associates was contracted to do our snow gate study. Um, based on that, they put about 25 questions together that were significantly important that we'd have to know about to, to go down this road. Uh, Crookston, Watford City, Jamestown, Minot, Sioux Falls. A lot of the information came from Sioux Falls though because they recently implemented snow gates about five years ago. Um, what they are all telling us is kind of matches what we kind of knew. Four inches of snow or less, they work well. As you start breaching that six inch mark, you see a lot of snow coming over the back of the gate and not relieving the pressure from the property owner or the streets narrowing. And so the snow has to go someplace. You don't have speed at this point, so it has to go someplace. Um, they also were unanimous in saying that if you're gonna do it, you have to put them on motor graders because they have the power and the traction to do it. Um, they also were very strong in saying that it's gonna slow your plow times down because uh, the gate operation uh, and, and the amount of time it's gonna take because you're operating motor graders instead of truck plows. Uh, the number one thing Sioux Falls reported back to us is they're not quite sure that the cost was worth the benefit they're receiving and neither is their property owners. They've got some articles out there that uh, have been in their paper to discuss some of the, the pros and cons. It depends on who you talk to. As a department in Public Works, we would love to go with snow gates, but there's a catch. So we talked a little bit about our fleet with wing plows. Um, our current plow width with a single vehicle is 23 feet. Um, and we're able to plow with our plow trucks usually around 12 miles an hour as we get into heavily vehicle neighborhoods. You know, it might be four miles an hour with a grader, might be eight, but eight is pretty standard, eight to 12 for us. Um, with the help from Sioux Falls, they are in their AVL, they were able to tell us their average is about four to six miles per hour operation of the gates. Um, and the hiccup is we can't put them on a wing plow. So, in order to move forward with this, we would lose that 23 feet per vehicle down to an 11 and a half foot vehicle. So what we're doing with one now requires two. So that's, a, that's the big number. So our, our consultant was able to pull the data from Sioux Falls and us based on what our times and our, our plow times are and the desire not to expand those plow times into the 30 hours after a snow storm or 35. Um, and they are estimating that we would need to add 29 motor graders to our fleet at a cost of about 7.5 million. Now you say 29 motor graders, is that real? Well, I will say Sioux Falls uses just over 50 in their city to uh, do their snow gates. So it, that is a pretty real number. We're comparable to Sioux Falls. We don't wanna forget about that purchase of that snow gate either. So that's about another half million to add it to the equipment and then Here's the one that kind of shocked us was because we weren't thinking on the side of, okay, we added 29 motor graders. We got to fuel them all. We got to maintain them all. We got to put cutting edges on them all. 
We have to change wipers on them all, plus we have to put an operator in the seat. So annually, it'd be about an increase of about 3.3 million. Um, based, again, I'm gonna say Sioux Falls, they said they added significant hauling to their operations because of the narrowing of the streets, especially when they had snowfalls very much like we've had this year. So they're est they estimated, based on the numbers that they provided and their cost, and how much additional hauling they had to do, we would be looking at about a half million dollars in increased hauling cost as well. What does that all mean? Year one, about 13 million. Capital cost, about eight. Annual cost, about 3.7. Again, my department would love to do this. It all comes down to the dollars and cents and whether the cost meets the benefit. Then we went and went another way. We looked at what if we hired a bunch of contractors with bobcats or skid steers with blowers on them, and when we got a snowstorm, you know, pair them up with our plow crews in our 15 zones and blow open the driveways. Might not be 24 feet wide, but it might be 20 or 15. Um, so talking with three different contractors in town, they figured that a charge would come in at two to four inches at $10. You know, and, and four to six, about 20, and any over that, it might be a little more. Visiting with them, they all thought they could do them in about three minutes. So all that plays in is we have about 23,000 residential driveways. In talking with the Solid Waste Division, that's the number that they felt comfortable, that 23,000 residential driveways that have driveways, not alleys. So breaking it down, and I am positive that our customers, our residents, would want this done in 10 hours after we plowed by the house. They would not want to wait longer than 10 hours to get that windrow cleared, because a lot of them would just do it themselves at that point. So if you did the math and went through, and based on the driveways, three minutes per driveway, you're looking that you'd have to contract out about 115 skid steers. Based on that, I took the low number for the be optimistic at $10 per driveway. We're looking at 230 or, or so per snow event. So we've had three snow events, one nine, one 12, one four. So we'd really be at about that two million mark this year we did spent on cleaning drivers. But these are all options. We gotta look at options, we gotta lay it out there and see if it's worth going down for the city of Fargo. Parking versus snow removal. I wanted to take a look and show you the benefit that we've done with interstate parking in Vanessa and how we've really improved our downtown snow and haul operations. If you're, and then we're gonna talk snow emergency and what does that mean and how does that look and what have we done on the background to get to this point where I think we can make this work. Seasonal night restrictions and then one side parking only. I got these numbers from Vanessa about two days ago from DART Downtown and Parking Enforcement. If you remember, um, right before October 1st, uh, you approved a um, agreement with interstate parking to do the night enforcement downtown. As we went into this, we were nervous because it had kind of fallen off the street department's radar or ability to do the parking enforcement, and PD is extremely busy at night as well with calls for service. So we knew it was gonna be bad to start. Um, so the first weekend, in talking with Vanessa, we said, let's do warnings for the first week. So we did first week. It was still not going as good as we had hoped. So we did another second week of warnings. So that's why you see the numbers versus citations are a little lopsided there because we did actually two weeks of warnings there and then we didn't go to the citations until the third and fourth week. Um, as we moved into November, you see when we are only doing warnings for the first time that they're in violation. Um, the second time is citation is repeat offenders. And as you see, the warnings continue to go down because a lot of people are learning, I got this warning ticket, I won't do this again. You're seeing those numbers drop off. We had a little spike in January, but overall our total numbers were down to that as we are today at 1169. Still a big number for violators parking illegally in the downtown, but it is working. We're seeing a noticeable difference. Um, we also are impounding when we come to go downtown and haul the snow. And this is something I don't like to do, but when you do the dollars and cents, and we hauled 31 car, or we impounded 31 cars off this last event, we waited till 
the last night of hauling on the snowstorm where we got the 12 inches because it was New Year's Eve. We're not gonna go start impounding cars on New Year's Eve, our first night of hauling downtown. And so we stayed away from that. We waited for our final cleanup. But by doing the parking enforcement and the impounding, we were able to haul the entire downtown in two nights. And what does that mean? That means that an additional $60,000 was not spent hauling our downtown. That means we get in there, it's about $60,000 $60, a night when we go down there to haul. We did it in two versus three. Snow emergency declaration. This is why we're really here today. And to let you know how it works a little bit. And this is kind of the plan we put together based on where we think we can go today. If you ask me the truth, I'd like to see it. Every time it snowed two inches or more, it automatically go in place. And a lot of the cities around the Minneapolis are going to one inch. Anytime basically it snows and you have to go plow, get them off the road. But we feel it's a fair uh, starter starting point to start at four inches or more when it's forecasted. Mayor declaration, so if the mayor does not find in favor of what staff does, which that happens, we're okay with that. If he does, that's good, but we have to have that elected official making that decision, not a staff member. What this will bring is all vehicles removed from streets and avenues until we've plowed curb to curb, or it's rescinded through the media. So based on where we're plowing in the high parking areas, it could be as soon as they have to be off the street for two hours and they could be parking on it. Once we've plowed it curb to curb, feel free to go back and park there. Um, we've talked to a number of different communities and they, they felt that worked really well because people weren't looking out their window going, oh, it's gonna be for 24 hours and you plowed my street and now it's gotta sit for 20 hours. You know, in logic, just let them park there again. Um, based on the communication I had with you folks this summer, we talked a $400 fine, we talked a $300 fine, we talked a $100 fine. So we kind of settled on this $100, $150 fine with the possibility to impound based on risk. So if that car is parked, say, 24 inches to 30 inches away from the curb and it's causing a traffic hazard, maybe we'll want to get it out of there rather than ticket it. So we wanna make sure we have some language in there that we have the ability to impound if needed. Um, and then I believe that we should have a graduated fine structure. I believe that the first offense, yes, you get your ticket, but if we have a person that is a repeat offender, that fine structure should double and go to 300. If we, it happens again and that person is a third time repeat offender within a winter, and I'm talking a winter section here, uh, the six months of winter we enjoy in Fargo, um, then it'd be 450. And so those people that are causing the issues that are not, you know, changing their practices and, and parking to match what our ordinance is, those are the folks we want to focus on, not the person that's here for one, one uh, weekend with visiting their children or, or visiting their mom or dad. So we've done some legwork to get to this point, and that was important. So one of the things we did is we sat down with NDSU, Mike Ellingson from NDSU, and I spent some time discussing options. So based on our conversations, um, this is something they would put as part of their training program for new students as they come on for orientation. They would put this in their monthly newsletter that they email to all their students. They would also email this out to all the students anytime we do a declaration. So we would have full access to their, we would, we would use their database to be able to send that information out. He also has said that there's some unused parking on the north side of NDSU, which could be opened up during the time period that we would have a declaration. Now, the students or people would have to walk a little farther than normal. They wouldn't be able to park where they wanted, but there is an option there. We also sat down with Rob Sobolik and said, how about during these declarations, we do some signing, we open some Fargo Dome lot, provide opportunity for some place for these cars to go. As Sanford being a large employer in, in North Fargo, and um, they came to one of the, the top of the list that I was concerned about with their employee parking. 
So in visiting with Jason Nelson and uh, corresponding with him, he did a count for their employee parking and their guest parking average. And it was comfortable in telling me that they can accommodate all off-street parking when we declare an event through their, their surface lots or uh, their garages. So that's a win for us. And that would be coordination with Sanford when we declare them. Now we have a lot of other areas that are gonna come to rise to the top when, you know, if this goes into place. And we have had conversations with the Fargo Park District because there's a lot of parks around town that there's parking available as well. So we'll have to deal with that stuff on an individual basis, but I think there's options out there. We also have the downtown option where all our ramps are free after five. So there is options out there. It just might require a little more effort by the property owner or the visitor. But really this is about getting the information out to these people so that they can share it when we do declare something like this. Enforcement was the number one topic that I didn't know how we were gonna go about it. I could handle the visits with others. I could handle trying to figure out reading different ordinances. So I called on my good buddy, Dave Todd. And he, basically we are matching their beat zones for enforcement. So they have 13 enforcement zones out there for beats. And what we're gonna have to do is this is gonna be probably be an overtime thing for his crew. That is simply what it's gonna be. At some point, if we have the ability to hedge this um, a week in advance with good forecasting, there's maybe the opportunity to do some scheduling changing to enforce this for us. But at the end of the day, it's gonna be about a two, three, two to three day notice to Dave's crew, the chief's crew, and overtime funding will need to be included in his budget for the future so we can make this happen. It's either we pay a consultant or we pay our own. In my philosophy or thought process in this, I'd rather pay our own because I know the job they produce and what they do. Yes? Ben, can I ask you a question? So could we have interstate parking help with the ticketing if, if the police are running short on hours or something like that? Is that a possibility? So uh, Vanessa has very limited staff during the night. It's something we could definitely talk with her during the day, but at the nighttime, she only has one staff member that tickets for us in the downtown. So that resource is gonna be a difficult one to tap into unless we're willing to pay them more on an annual basis to ensure that, that person, they have people that are available. Um, and as we move on to the next section, it's kind of one thing I've heard this winter is one side parking, side street parking. And we've, our team has sat down and said, okay, if we could do one side parking citywide and have one day a week maintenance in zones throughout the city, and we'd wanna coordinate that so that there's never any parking allowed on the fire hydrant side of the block, that would allow us to go in and haul these streets whenever we needed to. And the key is daytime hours between eight and 4.30 because our night, Seasonal night parking restrictions are not working. And I'll tell you this, it's an enforcement thing, number one. And again, everybody's busy at night, so there's, it, it's tough to enforce. But number two, people don't want us in their neighborhoods with loaders and blowers and big trucks and screaming and loud noise at two in the morning in front of their residential homes. They really don't. Um, that's a huge complaint we receive if we do have to go there, is that you kept me awake all night. And when we say all night, we did behind Ben Franklin's school two nights ago. And on 9th Street, between 14th and 15th Avenue, we hauled 29 truckloads off that one block. So we're not there for 15 minutes. We're there for two hours. And so if we could make a change to our parking to only allow it to one side, I truly believe we could remove our seasonal street avenue night parking, and we wouldn't have to have that in Fargo anymore, which means you, the people that are in that, those districts could park in front of their house every night of the week. Now, this I, I also have to give credit for the picture that was given. This is, I'm sure you guys have all heard from, this is one taken by John Wilson, um, one of our residents in Fargo that um, has concerns over tall grass and parking. 
I threw this in as a final slide. And based on a recap of the last, or the 12 inch blizzard, there was a lot of concern of why did it take too long? When we issue a no travel advised, that means stay home. Four wheel drive, stay home. This is a situation that we got to this point in plowing and then we had to stop. And we had to wait for that pickup in the back there to get out. And this was about on every fourth street. It was like this. People with cars need to stay home. We don't issue it every day. We don't issue it more than probably once a year, to tell you the truth. But it's imperative for us to get our job done that when a no travel advised, we're not faced with situations like this. But Ben, that's a little confusing sometimes because on the weekend we had a, there were events in the community on a Saturday <clears throat> and the interstates were closed. But within the community, you had plowed, so we people did, could we, get around. Yep, we didn't issue a no travel advice okay. for the community. This, the only time we've issued the no travel advice for the community so far this year is when we received the, the 12 inch snow accumulation. Generally, if it's just wind and four inches or four inches or less, we're fine. We have enough cover, we can do hot laps, we can keep everything. 19th Avenue is something we can't keep open, and 52nd Avenue, we had some significant issues um, based on the south wind. The north wind, we can, we can manage and keep up with it, but when that wind blows from the south, and all that south of there is agricultural, it has one place to go. And so, um, when ch the chief and I were out there that day, it was pretty obvious that we were putting everybody's lives at risk, and we typically don't close 52nd Avenue. Um, but there was no doubt in my mind when I drove through there that it, it, we had to close it right then and there. And I, I, had a citizen reach out to me. I had a citizen reach out to me when we have a no travel advisory, which means stay home. We've closed 19th Avenue, and yet the, there's an event at the Fargo Dome that's continuing on in the storm. So we didn't issue a no travel advice during that event. But the state had for the DOTs. So, but then again, we have, we're telling people not to go and stay home and we're closing 19th Avenue, and yet a city facility is having a major event and telling people how to get there still. Nope, and, and I, I agree the if I had my choice. Too. I, I will say that 19th Avenue North, we can have a no snow event and have to close it just because of the wind. If you look, it's, a, it's two miles of vacant land of runway, and then on the other side of that is agriculture. So 19th Avenue is a critical item, and I will agree that I would always prefer everybody to stay home. <clears throat> um, the biggest challenge when we have these minor events, four inches like this in town, people still have to go to work, employers still have to stay open, and so I agree with you, John. And, and my point is the mixed messaging we're giving people, yep. and we're putting people at risk. And at that point, you know, in, in resp looking back on the situation, we should have maybe put something out that we are not issuing it, no travel advised, to, to clarify it within the city limits. I think what we need to do, Ben, is clean up with Greg and talk about that because I think John's right, it was a mixed message because yes. state was putting out no travel and when I was driving around, there's all sorts of people going to work, doing different things during the time, all the, uh, the, the McDonald's and stuff were open, so people were getting to work somehow. But I, I think, John, to your point, we need to make sure it's clear to people because 19th may close and we may still have people doing business like normal in town because it's just a hard one to keep open. And 52nd may be a problem to us depending on the wind, but people still move around, so. Yeah, in that event, it, if you were in the inner city or even downtown here, you hardly knew we were having an event other than snow. But agreed, we need to be clear on our, on our statements we're making when we are allowing travel within the city. Just a question to the chief is uh, when we have a snow event, do you have more more uh, people on the street or do you have less? So to your point about ticketing, I thought oftentimes I see a lot of police officers out during the storm to make sure everybody's safe. Uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, our, our staffing is based on our, our beats, our, our um, geographical territories that each officer and each sergeant and each lieutenant are responsible for. So. If we have, uh, you know, 13 beats, we try to have a minimum of staffing of probably about 14 people, officers out there along with a couple of supervisors. Um, so it doesn't, during storm events, we don't necessarily have more or less staffing, it's the staffing is what we have. So that's, 
That's why we are working with Ben. That's on why you'd need more to... for the snow events when you're ticking. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So yes, yeah, exactly what we discussed is that, you know, having having a roster list of who would be willing to come in and work during those events, and then using them as the additional resources needed to pull to to make this happen. That our calls for service just don't seem to drop during these snow events. Um, we're about ninety-four thousand calls for service uh, for last year which is about 260 calls for service per day. And so the officers are just go, go, go. I mean, even, even though there's a blizzard out and there's no travel advised, it doesn't stop the domestics from happening or the medical emergencies and things like that. Mr. Chair, matters. I have a question. First that of all, Ben, I uh, <laughs> So, Chief, we shouldn't have people at home or what? No, go ahead. <laughs> Sometimes when you coop people up together in a home, it can, uh, it can cause issues too. First of all, I wanted to thank you for deleting out my license plate number on my truck. <laughs> no the, the, the other question I had, so you're, when you talk about the one side of the street, Avenue parking slide, so are you thinking of having that year round? I would love it year round. I just don't think it's practical. For the purpose of sweeping and stuff, I would love to have it year round. And if, if uh, our commission and, and elected mayor were willing to uh, take that on and say, yes, we would like that too. I would be 100% supportive of it. I'll just give you my, to my theory, I like keeping things simple. So we, we, we have to, you know, we vary at certain times of the year. I would be in favor of having it year round, but I think it's very important that you have an, the option on the either the avenues, yes. so the streets, so people can have an option to park on the street close by. For yeah. that, does that make sense? Yes, that's how we do it. We'd break it up into zones, so you'd be able to park on the avenue when you couldn't park in on the street. Because I, I think p once you got into the routine, then people get. And if we kept it all the time, then it's easier to keep track of. But the, I, so I'm in favor of that. And then the other thing you talked about the fire hydrants. Well, we already have rules. You can't park by fire hydrants no matter what. And so to me, that's not that critical. Go ahead and talk about that. I'm not going to speak for the chief or anything, but um, I, I think if, if you asked a lot of <clears throat> the fire department staff, they don't park directly in front of the vehicles or in front of the hydrant, but they will park within 15 feet of it. And so when you look at getting a, a ladder truck in there or a pumper truck and shortest connection possible and closest vicinity, and please correct me if I'm wrong here, but access is key to safety and speed. And so if there's no vehicle ever parked there and it's always clean of snow as far as the curb and gutter, I think that I think that fire would come aboard and say, yes, that makes a lot of sense. But yes, you're right. We don't allow parking in front of the side of the hydrants. And if I could uh, inquire, how much are we spending on overtime now with these events that we're having last year and this year? And I guess where I'm leading with that is how much of that overtime ex unbudgeted extra costs can we deploy into equipment and staff on an ongoing basis so that we can grow your service of capability but also reduce these, these extra ex exorbitant costs? So like I said, we, we've had a rapid growth in the last 10 years, really, when you talk to other cities of our size. There's, you know, I talked to West Des Moines. That's kind of one of the, the key cities that I bounce ideas off of for things and then up into Anchorage, Alaska. And, and nobody has seen the amount of lane miles that we have added in a community our size. Now based on that, we've reached a point that we've kind of turned every knob that we can by adding wings, uh, by multitasking our staff, using our water department staff, our forestry staff. You know, on this list of equipment, I don't include any sanders because our forestry division runs all our sand trucks. Our mains and hydrants division runs all the alley plow trucks. So we've diversified as much as we can amongst our staff within Public Works. We have reached a point that we are going to have to start adding. This year we added two additional staff in 2020, <laughs> but with those staff we also have to look at equipment <clears throat> purchases too. So how much are we spending on overtime? How much are we spending on overtime? So our budget overtime is 189000 We We spent about 400 last year. And how much are we spending on contracting all these trucks and all their services? So to date, on build, what I have paid to bills to date, that we're about 700000 for this winter. On budget, we budget 200000 So, and last winter in total, because of the extreme winter and the amount of snow we had to haul, 
and which includes pushing it up, which includes all the activities to fuel everything. We are right around that $1.1, $1.2 million over budget, Street Department. And two years ago, where were you? I gave back 300000 Yeah, so. Tony, do you want some? Yeah, I mean, this one, the first one here is more for the other commissioners. Uh, $150 for a fine, for a parking fine, to me seems excessive. I, I agree with the idea. I understand the idea. I support the idea. Uh, of, of giving getting a system in so we can remove the snow more efficiently, which will save us all uh, dollars at the end of the day and a lot of headache. Uh, but $150 for once, and then God forbid you get, you get uh, caught again, uh, you just paid another $300. For some people, that's their monthly rent. Or for some people, that's what they make in a week. You know what I mean? And that's who are actually going to get the most, is the people who live in apartments. You don't have anywhere, anywhere else to go. That, that's who you're going to get the most. You're not going to get the guy who has a, a four-stall garage, you know? Um, so I think we need to rethink that, you know? The downtown parking, if you get uh, a citation, it's usually a warning first for that for that time frame. And then if you get caught again, I think it's $15 or something. And then it goes up to 20 or 30 or whatever it is. It's a graduated scale, but the first time is free. Um, so I think if, if we implement this, you're going to have a, people, a lot of people push back anyway. But then you're going to find them $150 to $450. You're going to get a lot of people pushing back and not supporting it at the end of the day. So I think we need to rethink that number. I think 50 for the first ticket, and then maybe 100 for the second, and then we can talk about whatever after that. But you know, I could run a stoplight in the city of Fargo right now, and it costs less than 150, and that's a safety issue. That's a, that's not going to hurt somebody, you know. Uh, so that, that's that's far too much. As far as the varied parking, um, you know, I've already heard it from people that that have heard this idea that say, you know, look, I, I pay property tax, I pay specials, I pay sales tax, all for infrastructure for my road up here, and now I can't park on the, on my street. You know what I mean? Things like that. So. I understand, you know, maybe one day a week here, the other day a week on the other side, um, but I, I like it simple too. And I thought where Dave was going with that was let's just leave it alone when we, when we don't have to enforce it. Just let people park where they want to park. Um, you know, I personally, you know, I park my motorcycle on my street a lot. And I got, I got towed in front of my own house because it was there for 48 hours. I didn't even know that was a rule, you know what I mean? <laughs> so um, that to me is not simple, that's complex, and it's not hurting anybody, so let's, let's leave that alone. So let's vary where we need to vary it. Let's make the varying as simple as possible. And let's not over fine people because you're going to lose support in a hurry if you start hitting people in the pocketbook that hard. Mr. Chairman, I, just one more thing. The, the It's a safety issue now. So, I, I mean, driving from my house to here multiple times, there's cars parked and the road goes from two lanes to one lane. And so there's traffic head on. Uh, it's a safety issue. It isn't. And, and so uh, we have to act because it's, it's, it's no longer this is inconvenient. Uh, this is, you, you have potential accidents all the time, and people are good about taking turns, but that's not how, that's not how our roads were con originally made to work. And so we, we have to change this. It's been unusual, but I do like Ben's option of, uh, we have winters where we don't have this much snow. We have short memories. It might seem like this happens. Sometimes we don't have as much snow. Usually that's when I buy a new snowblower, then it sits there for a winter because it, uh, it never snows. But you have to take into that into account that uh, we're, we're dealing with some unusual circumstances. But I think this shows we, we got to take action because uh, uh, what's go what's going on now? It's not safe for our citizens. Well, Ben, you also know you ticketed people, which they knew it was 150, and they still didn't move their vehicles. They didn't. People, you, we still have to pay the expense of doing that. I think you've had two element two two uh, episodes this winter, where you've had them clogged up with cars. People just didn't move. <coughs> yeah, uh, and and you'd be surprised. A lot of times we see developments where there's the three stall garage and the vehicle is left on the street. And really it comes down to the cleanup after that car moves. Because um, what we have to do is continue to send resources out. We get a lot of calls. Okay, my car moved, can you come plow the street? Or my neighbor's car moved, come plow the street. And that adds additional resources and time that we gotta do if we could do it in the first time. And I'll, I'll talk about the, the one side only a little bit here. You know, I was just throwing that out for to thought today. Okay, we're not, that's not what I'm gonna be bringing to commission. It's the, the snow emergency for parking is what I'm gonna be bringing to commission. But these are things that my staff and I are trying to find a better way to do things and eliminate some of the restriction for the property owners. Again, I really hate the, I really think that property owners hate the overnight parking restrictions, the street avenue parking restrictions. I really think they hate them. So if we could find a way to do something different, I think that we need to do that. And what you're actually doing is transferring from a night restriction 
do a daytime description, thinking everybody's at work during the daytime. That's correct. And, and, and then you could come in there and then you're not bothering people in the middle of the night, basically. Uh, and that's the key with that, is we looked at, okay, when, when do we want to be in those neighborhoods? We want to be in there after the kids have gotten to school, and hopefully we're finishing up before they get home, or people are getting home from work. So that's why we'd say, okay, yes, you have to park on one side of the street here, all the other days, but one day a week there's no parking allowed and it's from 8 to 4.30. Because then a lot of people are at work, a lot of people are gone, not everybody, but a lot of people are gone. We can get in and do a safe cleanup because kids are at school, people are at work, and then and then hopefully it'll be a successful operation. Great discussion and question, I guess, is what's the next step from a timing and what I'd like to see is a decision we make that's not one piece of the puzzle solved and then you know six months later another piece I'd like to see a comprehensive list of things that we're going to implement whether whatever the level of the fine ends up being to you know changes in behavior on parking on streets um, that's going to have cost implications as well with sign and sign removal because when we started this my understanding was if we could clear the streets it was an economies of scale of going from four miles an hour to ten miles an hour to get through the neighborhoods faster, which would save money. Right. And and Snowgate's being part of that because then it slows it down, like you illustrated. But then at the end of the day, there's probably going to be an economy of scale on a perfect world if we could get to eighty percent of a perfect world. Right. Um, because <coughs> I think that's you know my mind the next steps because um, there's going to be cost, but there's also going to be savings if we do this right. Um, and I think. That's what I'd like to see what's next with an ordinance or a list of things that we need to address in the next round of budgeting so that the public understands that we didn't just raise a create a fine for parking on the streets. We did this, 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 and this to really look at the overall city's growth and be much more efficient with uh, the overall bigger picture. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and just a little more background, which I didn't provide, is right now we already are in the winter months from 19th Avenue to I-94 only allow parking on one side of the street. So that was put into place um, through uh, traffic engineering about three years ago and through the commissioner's approval, or five years ago, I'm sorry, five years ago. So that is already in place. We would just be looking at expanding those zones a little bit, but you bring up some very valid points. Um, I think for this winter, it's I would like to just work on this and get things coming forward, bring it together as a total package, but I need the direction from the commission and the mayor to where you'd like that fine structure to be so that I can work with Nancy to bring this forward. And we can talk about it at the next commission meeting. I can put it on the agenda and we can make some decisions at that time. Or Well, well let's just have them weigh in today because Mr. Garrick has weighed in, but maybe the rest of the commissioners can weigh in, because especially that 150, 300, 450. What, what do you guys want? <clears throat> well, I, I, maybe the chief has an opinion on that as well. It has to be strong enough to be a deterrent. deterrent. But my desire would be that we empower you to come back with a plan and whether we work with you individually, because you and yep. I spent some time together, um, some questions that I had. I would like to see us make a decision though later than April 1st and not kick this can down the road through the summer or into next fall. Let's do it during the winter. Um, and April 1st would be in my mind when to have this decision, but that's just me. I don't want to prolong it another six No, and, and we can do that. What I'm, I'm talking about is that really it will fully go into effect start of next winter. And the first, we'll have everything in place, signage done all this summer, everything, all the public meetings as far as with NDSU, go through, get everything dialed in. But really we want it in place and agreed by the commission by the end of this winter. Ben, when you say t ticketing uh, of 150 to 300 to 400, does that also include towing? That does not include towing. I mean, is towing also implemented if we're ticketing them as well? We're gonna include, I, in talking with Nancy Morris, it would be nice to be able to have, not totally write out that possibility to impound it based on risk or safety. You know, I think that's important that we don't limit ourselves to a ticket. And the graduated cycle is just an option that I threw in there to bring it up and, and stir the pot a little bit. If we do 50, if we do 100, if we do 200, it's better than what we're doing today. How much is the cost typically for somebody when they've had their vehicle towed? 
The tow is $90. The impound release by day is $20 a day, and the impound release uh, fine for to get it out is $10. So you're at you're at um, $130 by the time you get all said and done. So I'll chime in with Commissioner Gehrig there. We're going to penalize the poorest people the most. I, I don't know that our intention is to make money on this process. Our, our intention is to get a result so you can access the streets and do your jobs effic effectively. As far as I'm concerned, towing is a pretty adequate uh, deterrent right there. If you come out and your car has gone and you've had it towed, and you're going to pay a hundred and some dollars to get it back out and go find it. You know, uh, I'd start there. Just step up the towing sooner, and and not worrying about the 150 or four or three up to the, you know the excessive ticketing. I you know I, again this, these tickets are worth more than some of their cars are. So I will throw this out there, uh, Commissioner Strand is. We don't have the storage space in our impound lot with what we're doing right now. So we, we would need to look at a different impound lot to go down that road. We would also look at probably doing a different contract. Right now, when we do for the downtown, 18 cars with five wreckers to get from, pick them up to the impound lot, bring it and come back, pick another one with five wreckers, takes about three hours. And that's for 18 to 20 cars. We have hundreds of cars that are illegally parked, not just 15 or 18 there there the, the number is hundreds and when we ask and really say nicely please remove them they don't listen another topic coming down the road at us is our neighborhood our core neighborhood study uh, process and what's happening across the country uh, generally and we will have these discussions here is they're stepping up density in core neighborhoods and reducing the the parking restrictions so if we're not careful, we could ex exacerbate this problem even more with new policy down the road that's, that lightens up your parking issues in these neighborhoods that you're already challenged with. So as that unfolds, we'll have to keep an eye on those policies and their implications to snow removal. And uh, John, just so you know, on the budget, uh, budget committee will relook at that. We put two people more on Ben's who He does a great idea of using different people within our, uh, our city to help out in different ways. But this is, again, a cast of huge snow event that we had, and we don't build our whole budget for the you know worst blizzard we've had in 15 years. We have to build it for yearly. So the way we do that sometimes is subcontracting and work with other people. There's a balance there, and we do have an idea sometimes how much overtime is in the budget, but we'll continue to work on that. This is just the same we do every year as we look at the budget, here's what happened, we need to address it. I think what Ben brings up, which we and I talked about, is we may have to add more personnel because the city is growing. So it's just like police force, Chief Todd came with a 10-year plan, and he had people added almost five a, a year, basically. We have to look at public works the same way. So we'll do that. So A couple other notes, notations. Um, we might consider doing a code red through the tele Maybe you already are through the phone systems if there's a declared we, emergency. We are not because we were going to go through forward with that with the downtown and the parking enforcement this year start there, but we just changed carriers to a, from code red to a, a different. So we're kind of in limbo. It happened in January of this year. Or some sort of yes. an alert system. Yes. I'd also recommend we, we survey the public. You know, Commissioner Gehrig put it out on uh, his social media. If you had these services increased, would you be willing to pay higher taxes? And I was really interested in hearing you say that, higher taxes. But you're <laughs> posing the question. And I think we should ask the people, what are you willing to pay? What are you needing? What would you want? Because we're here to serve you and, and not just assume mm -hmm. we know where they're at. It would be nice to have their mandate direct us. Okay. We can definitely do that. And work with Greg on some of that information he's get it out there and polling yeah because just as far as just the discussion of, of the fine um, you know I, I'm, I'm ready to support what we're doing here with, what, with what's been presented I would hate to vote no against it based on the fine you know what I mean so if we can get somewhere if we can even compromise somewhere between 50 and 75 dollars something like that I think for a lot of people that's that's plenty of shock to a system and to get that okay. um, and then if they get another one for 150 after that I, th I think that would really drive it home and it, honestly, if they don't get it by then, and you're telling them, you're not, you're not going to reach these people, all right? Some of those folks you're not get to. So, um, like John was saying, I think if you find them, and then the next time you tell them, if, if you know, pick the worst offenders, right? The guys who park six feet from the curb, I, I'm not, I'm, that's fine with me if you told them. You know what I mean? Um, but it, only if it's a safety issue. So, lesser fine, be, 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 I'm fine with those, and then telling the guys that are really offensive, uh, 
that, that's where I think we should go. I think the public will really understand that and appreciate it and then back the system more than, than if it was a higher. Mr. Strand. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm going to invoke the names of two of our uh, folks in our community who have died who were strong advocates over the years for uh, relative to accessibility issues. Bruce, Bruce Brovold, who we all heard from, and Keith Bjornsson, who were, who were great advocates for, for the world of folks who, who faced uh, capability, handicap, handicapped issues and accessibility issues. And, and Ben and I have visited in the past, and I'm not sure how many uh, people in Fargo know, but there are cities, for example, like Rochester, New York, where I used to live, where they come out and when there's a snow event, they clean all the public sidewalks. And you know, that sounds like a, a, a rather gargantuan challenge, and it would be. But on the other hand, if you're in a wheelchair and, and your life depends on access, you know, it's a quality of life discussion point. So I hope you still have on your radar, and I know you've looked at some other cities that do this, but I'd like far, folks in Fargo to know that this is another thing we could explore doing not just the streets, not just your driveways, but the public sidewalks as well. And there are models of what others do. And the question is, is this worth, uh, would you pay a little more for this service? I think it would be a great quality of life enhancement to walk out in the mornings after a snow event and all your public sidewalks are done. Because I lived in a community that did that. I'd like to know the average snowfall for Rochester though, John, because that sounds like a huge task. Our costs will be less. Mm -hmm. Our costs will be less. How would they be less? We won't have as much snow. <laughs> Any other comments? I think we're done. Thank you, Ben. Nice job. Appreciate it. Thanks, Ben. Any questions?